welcome to MBS2 Reviews and Discussion Podcast. I am your host, Norman Sanzo. Joining me today is Silver Quill. I am legally obligated to say happy holidays rather than any other greeting, but I made it with the utmost sincerity. Ah, thank you so much, Silver Quill. And yeah, um, this week we have a Koroko special. Yay! Huzzah! Yes. <laughs> so anyway, in today's episode of, you know, I'm gonna take that back. And in this festive episode, we are going to review season eight, episode fifteen, the Hearts Warming Club. In this episode, a prank gone wrong ruins heartwarming Eve preparations, and while Twilight tries to figure out which of her student is behind it, the student bond over shared memories of home. And, well, it's one of those episodes, so yay. What do you mean, one of those episodes? It's a holiday special, yay. Oh, I can hear the excitement in your voice. I was trying to do deadpan. (laughs) (laughs) Yay, I I, I don't know. I I, I trained myself to do the yay so well now. (laughs) Uh, but still, uh, before we hit in, first impressions are in order. And Silver, what do you think? I had a lot of fun watching this episode, uh, especially the earlier stories. One of the traits of this episode is that it goes for reverse expectations. Ooh. And w- when you start uh, with Ocellus' uh, flashback or descriptions, y- you're taken aback by how it's presented, and it's it's a really good laugh. But as the stories go along, you start to pick up on the joke and then you expect it. So, unfortunately, when Sandbar's story comes along, you're like, what, that's it? That's it? (laughs) Yeah. You're a boring pony, Sandbar, and you should feel bad when talking. Oh, no. I mean, uh, it's kind of true. It's kind of true when you think about it. But think about this. Like, okay, that's the story that Sandbar is spinning. But in actuality, he goes to the human world for his holiday. (laughs) Well, no, that would be fascinating if he goes into, like, the Equestria Girls setting. <laughs> yeah. But here's the thing. I'm being harsh on Sandbar, but that's because they didn't give him a chance to shine as an individual for a while. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gallus. Gallus became a fandom darling. I know. Like, this episode made Gallus the sympathetic, s- sensitive one. But, well, or at least, uh, sensitive. He probably is, but he does a really good job of hiding it. Yeah, he's the sensitive, brooding one. Like, oh, like, this is boring. But in actuality, like, oh, I'm having so much fun. Yay! Maybe he's one of those guys, he's play, he's playing, like, super goth music on one hand, but he's humming one of Pinkie Pie's songs. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, we, we're creating a narrative for Gallus here. Actually, I'm just, I'm still kind of in shock. Uh, I was having dinner with friends last night, and I learned that Snow Patrol is considered uh, really dark. The new, I don't want to use the term emo because it's just insulting. No, I. but it's meant to be the new feel bad song. So, Wait, really? Snow Patrol? I thought Snow Patrol was kind of a uh, new metal or what you would call this Linkin Park kind of song. Well, Linkin Park is considered hyper depressed too. I, I would have used Linkin Park if not for the suicide of its lead singer oh. this year. 2018. Tough year. Uh, yeah, but still, um, it didn't compare to 2017. You guys had it rough. Oh, and then there's 2016, where, look, still think 2016 was the worst. But that's why I like a holiday that calls you to to be positive. True, true. true. Except if you're Griffin. Uh, yeah, we will get right into that later. So anyway, um, on to me and my impressions. I like this episode. This episode subverts what I was thinking about how a holiday special works. Probably if I watch a lot of probably if I watch a lot of Saved by the Bell, I might have gotten the vibe, but mm, I didn't watch that much, so I got no idea. But for this one, this episode here was a lot of fun. I like the backstory of how each creature had their own specific holiday on quote-unquote Christmas. So... Yay, much awesomeness is diverse like us. So yay, much awesomeness. And the traditions that they bring along is kind of cool. Especially the changeling tradition. That is, you know what? I think we're going to have a 
short discussion when we get to there. But anywho, if you guys have not watched this episode yet, Paul is here. Welcome back. I hope you enjoy the episode. So let's get right into it. We start off with our lead character, Sandbar, singing a holiday tune. It's the um, heartwarming song. Uh, I, I got no idea. Pony's voices fill the night. Heartwarming if he's here once again, something like that. And once he passes off to Ocellus, Ocellus likes hum. Yes. Which is a little telling of Sandbar that he just expects everyone to know uh, the heartwarming song, even though they're not from around here. True, but it's how do we put this? Uh, in my mindset of how Sandbar is thinking right now, it's hyper commercialized. Like you go to any person and you sing the Jingle Bell song, and every Tom Dick and Harry would know, but it's shy to sing it because it's a kiddie song. And I'm you, you won't be I won't be caught dead singing that song. Yeah. If I went up to someone and just started singing that song at them, I think I'd either get decked in the face or have the cops called on me. But Silver. Uh, if you were singing it around Christmas or Christmas Eve, then yeah, eh, you know it works. No, no. Here's the thing: a group of people singing that on the street corner are carolers. A guy who comes up to you <laughs> and starts singing in your face is crazy. <laughs> well, no, I the difference. Know. Goodwill sword men, indeed. Oh boys. Well, that's how I think. <laughs> oh boys, <laughs> I'm a strange one. Uh, I probably get. Deck while I'm in the States. <laughs> oh my. But anywho, Gallus here thinks like you because not every creature knows about you pony holidays. Get real. Everybody knows about festivals. Sha. <laughs> uh, so yeah, um, while Smolder's talking about or complaining about uh, said holiday or whatever it is, uh, Spike comes up to her and says, Everybody knows about uh, heartwarming. You get presents and presents and presents. Did I miss about presents? Yes, presents. Well, at least he's keeping his mind in the present. I know. <laughs> and Twilight just says, like, oh, yeah, the holiday is really awesome. It's all about sharing your happy feelings with your friends and family and stuff. And talking about friends and family, um, everybody's uh, school's officially ended for the holidays. You guys can go to your home enjoy the holidays and you six year get ready to pack i'll send you to the train station yay although i gotta wonder about that there train how far does it go i feel like the friendship express has a certain tardis like ability yeah probably probably i mean if you really think about it the train has been known to go to part of the hippogriff country Part way, sorry, um, part way to the Hippogriff Country, uh, all the way to Mount Eris, um, somewhere to the Crystal Empire where Yona lives part way because she lives in Yakistan and there's no train station there. And the Dragonland, I got no idea. Well, who knows? Some of them have the benefit of flight, so I guess the long distance travel isn't quite the same. Although that ruins the joke. I just flew into the Griffinstone and by, boy, are my wings tired. Ba-dum-tsh. Everyone just looks at you like, yeah, you're a griffin. Get a rider. Oh, hecklers. But before I carry on, um, there's the heart, fire heart thing. What did they call it? Something to represent oh, the holidays. See. Well, I know that it's it represents the fire of, from the, uh, oh, was it a heartwarming tale? No, no, that was, no, that was their Christmas carol. Goodness, what was that ep- that season two episode? Oh, wow. that, that, that is long, like it has been a while. Uh, season two, hmm. Uh, Eve. Oh, there you go. Uh, but yeah, that's the fire from there. Yep, yep. But anywho, um, let's carry on because as the student disperse, there is an assailant, an assassin, if you say. He kind of poured something onto the heart and it exploded. Oh no, leaving every creature there in a pile of purple gunk. Ew. They've been smoothed. Ew. Also, that's called the fire of friendship. Ah, all right. So Rainbow Dash flies to the alcove and discovers that, oh no, this is not an accident. This was on purpose. And, oh, there is the assailant. 
after him or it and said assassin or said assailant runs through the student dormitory and is well hiding there rainbow dash tries to go to the back door to see if he could have escaped there and come back saying nah it's locked so it has to be one of you six here who is the perpetrator come up and fess up and so we've got a game of clue in the works yes much fun I say it's the butler with the uh, spatula. I say it was Miss Yona in the dormitory with the rubber chicken. Hmm, I got no idea how to play Clue. You, you want to know what? I never played Clue before. Like Asp. I know. It's one of those things where board games are not a hot deal for us here. <laughs> what about the movie Clue? Oh man, I haven't even watched that one. Is it worth it? Oh, oh it's very much worth it. All righty then. Uh, there's something on my list to watch instead of Kung Pao. <laughs> it's comedy gold. Oh, comedy. Although, although I'm, this is a little foreign to me. I'm used to giving Sapphire a hard time for not seeing a movie. Well, eh, well I'll take her place for a bit. <laughs> All right. Well, then the the same uh, charges apply if you say oof. Okay. Oof. Okay. No, that 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 was more of a dog impersonation. <laughs> yes. So anyway. The student six go back to the mess hall and see the mess that's over there. Oh no! <laughs> Which is kind of funny that the uh, the description or the the summary meant to entice people it says this is a prank gone wrong. No, this prank went exactly as planned. It's just not a good prank. Yeah, and I would say that the synopsis that was written was not correct or was not right. And in all honesty, I got no idea who wrote the description for this. Eh, it's not a big deal. I still remember 20 pranks later, they basically gave away the quote-unquote twist. True that. Uh, that's why you don't read the synopsis before you watch it. Uh, it's spoiler territory, or spoiler country. But anywho, as the students six look at the mess, Rainbow Dash is pointing out, okay, who's the culprit? You better raise your hand. And Twilight just says, okay, okay, Rainbow, that's not going to work. Here's how we're going to do. Everybody close your eyes. Now... If you're guilty, please raise your hand and admit that you're guilty. And nobody does. Leg ass. So, with that out of the way, Twilight just says, Okay, you know what? You guys are grounded for a while until this mess is clean and until we know who the perpetrator is. I'm going to set an interrogation room in the back and when I call your name, you're going to be sit down to a chair and a flashlight will be flashing in your face and we're going to ask you 20 questions. Alrighty then, now get to work. I can just imagine Twilight trying to run interrogation. Rainbow Dash, go get the bottomless trousers and release the rampant wildebeest. <laughs> oh no, not the wildebeest! Oh, boys. But anyway, while the students started cleaning, they're just speculating on who could be the one that did this. This is terrible. Twilight comes in and calls for a volunteer to get interrogated. By the wildebeest. Oh no. Get a sis. Oh you know what? I'll go. I'll go. So that's kind of funny that he misses out on the very first story. But I'll tell you all true. Ocellus is my favorite of the Hearts Warming stories. Really? Well, okay. Like I said, these stories put forth an idea and then try to undermine your expectations. It's Humor is often found in betraying what people expect. It's like, uh, I joke that Cadence is an adrenaline junkie. I'd love it if in a scene, everyone else is terrified and she's just going, Whoa, that was fun. Yeah, that, that would be great. <laughs> so here's Ocellus quoting all these very, uh, you know, traditional holiday events. But they're taking them in the most literal sense. <laughs> yep. And uh, you know what? I'm going to set it up and then you can explain it to the audience. So uh, Ocellus kind of woes and being worried about being late going home for the holidays because uh, Heartwarming Eve is her favorite holiday. Uh, Sandbar just questions that, hey, uh, you guys just recently gotten your independence, and how is Heartwarming... How, how are you celebrating Heartwarming? That's kind of strange. And Ocellus goes to the tale about how after their independence, Twilight gave them a uh, scroll describing what heartwarming is and silver would you like to tell the story 
Well, basically, Twilight published the whole freaking book on this thing, which it's Twilight. That's expected. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the traditions and fun of housewarming. Here's a guide to help you enjoy the celebration of pony history. Families start the holidays by putting a tree up. And, yeah, I never really thought about how, if you took that literally, you would be hanging a tree. <laughs> it's it's up. It's yep. definitely up. <laughs> I mean, I think your holiday has been turned upside down, but sure. Mm -hmm. And then this is where word choice is important. Thirsty, dive into some holiday punch, which that's a lot of punch to have. Yeah. I don't know if I'd want to drink it, though. Yeah, but but if you were to twist it a bit right and, like, say holiday punch, you'll start a boxing ring. <laughs> or would you have to, like, take a branch from the holiday tree, wrap it around your fist, and then that's a holiday punch. Oh, that's just painful. Oh, no. Maybe I should be... Silver, uh, December be... 26th, Boxing Day. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> oh, wow. Literal. Very literal. Of course, that it, that leads us into the next literal joke. Just before bed, everybody, every pony exchanges gifts. <laughs> and it's just them giving it in a circle. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, boys. And uh, the, the next one is build a fire and light it up. <laughs> and sing carols. And they just sing carols, carols, carols. See, that's the fun of it. <laughs> but um... It's like taking things that they're most literal. And you kind of get, it takes the audience off guard, and that just makes it more fun. Yep, yep. To draw a strange comparison, you went to go see Coco, yeah? Yeah, yeah. You Did you also see the Frozen the Frozen special before it? No, I was lucky not to. Y indeed, you were. There's this whole scene where Olaf is going over holiday traditions, and he's adding probably the most cynical interpretation of them. It's funny because you realize, hey, yeah, Santa Claus is a guy who breaks into your home. <laughs> but it completely ignores the spirit. This is not a cynical interpretation, but a literal one. <laughs> and the, the excitement is still there. So there's still the joy. It's just they're getting it slightly wrong. <laughs> and that's really charming. Yeah. And talking about getting it wrong, uh, San Barcio says, and I quote, you might have misunderstood things just a little. And also let's just say, yeah, we don't care. It's our holiday. Deal with it. Besides, Applejack would give him an earful. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> yep. And here's the thing. Uh, from what we learn of the ponies, um, celebrating a holiday is, well, you can celebrate it however you want. The Pie Sisters has rocks for heartwarming. The Apple have apples. And Twilight has a big giant castle. So, yay. I'm a little concerned what Hasty Turnip has for his holidays. I bet it's a lot of turnips. Okay, well, now I want to quote like Godzilla. Wow, that's a lot of turnips. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Gallus comes back, and Twilight is asking for Ocellus. And while Ocellus is being interrogated, Yona says, like, I don't want to be late. I want to go back home and smash stuff. Because our holiday is smash awesomeness, because we got a big green giant that wants to smash stuff. But that's only in the MCU, so we have to do something else now. <laughs> this one's a little less funny for me just because it's uh well it's basically just one joke they like to smash i know isn't it smashing although i gotta ask which is the better holiday song carols 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 or yak song <laughs> yak song not very long sing again <laughs> uh, no comment but yeah um but this is what i mean by each creature in Equestria having their own holidays. And even though we say that the Yak holiday is boring and kind of meh, for them, it's a holiday that they enjoy and like. And they have a lot of what you would call this tradition. Sit tradition have a lot of smashing, but still, it's their tradition. Who are we to say, right? I'm the guy who doesn't want to be the thing they're smashing. I feel like that's an important component. If their holiday involves smashing a living creature, I think I draw the line. True. But you know, if Hulk was to be there, he would totally fit in. Hulk feels so at home here. Would almost cry angry tears <laughs> if they not radioactive. <laughs> Hulk smash for love. <laughs> Hulk going to enjoy Yak Hot Tub. <laughs> oh, that image in Rutherford's brain now. <laughs> oh, boy. 
And talking about burning in the brain, we move on to the next holiday. And the next holiday is from Smolder. And Smolder has, well, kind of a holiday. It's where all of the dragon come together and tell stories. And Smolder's story is a dream come true. So I'm going to summarize here because I can't really tell the story that well. So the story involves a little dragon who lives outside in poor weather. The dragon dot comes to her and says, Young child, um, follow me to my cave and have a feast. So in the cave, the young dragon eats gems and have merriments with the dragon lord's family and friends. Yay! While this is going on, the little dragon looks at the bloodstone scepter and thinks to herself, wouldn't it be nice if I could steal that? Wouldn't it be good if I could steal that? And she saw her chance and, well, took it. And now she is the dragon lord and force the previous dragon lord to sleep outside in the rain like she was and story ends <laughs> now we're going for the really dark betrayal of expectations although according to the wiki i'm i'm surprised to learn of the legend of the farmer and the viper oh this may have been an inspiration or at least it follows a similar tale uh basically a farmer finds a viper freezing in the in the snow and taking pity on it brings it back home to warm it. But upon reviving, the viper bites him, and as its venom kills the farmer, the farmer demands, why did you do that? And the and the viper just says, did you not know that there is enmity and a natural antipathy between your kind and mine? Do you not know that the serpent in the bosom, a mouse in a bag, and fire in a barn give their hosts an ill reward? <laughs> Basically, it's, it's not saying kindness is wrong, but you have to be aware of who you're helping. True. But in this scenario here, it's kind of strange. There's the discussion of archetypes, especially about uh, the king. Actually, I'm not sure if the uh, dragon lord is male or female. Uh, looks female. Either way, she's in the role, basically, of the king. And a good king is aware of threats and is on guard against them, you know, trying to promote. So at first, this, uh, this dragon lord is trying to promote general good amongst uh, peers, but is very careless with the very source of their power and authority. And so there's actually a lesson here. You can't be careless when you're in charge. Even when you're trying to help, you have to be aware. And this dragon lord pays for her lack of awareness. So as much as everyone wants to say that Smolder and the dragons are horrible, there is actually a lesson to this tale. True. Dragon tail. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true, that's true. I mean, there's always a lesson to be learned from every story. And interpretation is, well, eye of the beholder kind of situation. And in this scenario here, yes, you should be careful of who you bring in. Or the other point of view is, hey, there's an open opportunity. It's there, I'll take it. <laughs> and dragons like stories where the weak are oppressed by the strong. Well... There's, you know, I've never heard of a culture that said, yeah, we like being jerks. No comment. I mean, maybe that's the the motto of New York. I don't know. <laughs> hey, New Yorkers are not that bad. Hey, that they've got that famous New Yorker attitude. I don't, how did a family member of mine put it? They'll pick up your wallet and give it back to you, but they won't wait around for you to take it back. <laughs> First time I heard of it. Yeah, they'll just shove it in your chest and be on their way. Yeah, it, 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 it's nice in their own way. Good thing they're not Floridians. Oh, Florida, the crazy capital of America. Yep. Anywho. <laughs> yep. So, anywho, uh, the creatures tell Smolder that that's a horrible story. And Smolder says, yeah, we like being jerks. Yeah, true that. And Silverstream gets called to meet the wildebeest. And <laughs> what? You started the narrative. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, uh, I'm thinking of other interroga interrogation methods. There's one, uh, roll up their pants and fetch the bucket of slippery toads. Oh, no, not the slippery toads. Except there's a critical flaw. None of these characters are wearing pants. Oh, how scandalous. Oh, no. And yeah, let's move on to the next story. And the story of 
sand bars. The day that my heartwarming doll almost fell into the fire. Ooh. He kind of gives away the whole story with the title. I mean, I got to talk in points for that. Yep. So you start off like any heartwarming Eve. You set up your dolls on the mantle and leave it for Santa to give you something. I don't know. But suddenly... He put his doll near the edge of the mantle, and it falls. Oh, no! And the creatures ask, what happened? Oh, it just fell on the floor. Nothing happened. Great story, Sandbar. You're going to be an awesome dude. Well, I think he's got a future in the theater because he had him spellbound up until the end. <laughs> he just needs a better writer. Yep, yep. This is sort of the last hurrah of, of betraying expectations. You're expecting something big and horrible, and it's just like, eh, just a quick moment. That's all it is. It's just a quick non-event, and you're like, oh, we just had a story of a dragon lord being ousted and forced out into the cold. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Sandbar, you're coming into this too late. Yep, yep. I mean, the expectation was low. If you started off your story first and then Ocellus, it would be good, but nah, your, your story is lame. But... The funny thing is that uh, Silverstream's recounting of the uh, hearse war of how they celebrate, totally different thing. There's no betrayal of expectations. It's really expanding on uh, hippogriff culture. And once again, trying to get uh, some mileage out of the Storm King. True, true, because I they paid uh, Shavadavi a lot. It's true, but I still find it funny. He wasn't that impressive a villain. And yet, he's always presented, in this case, larger than life. <laughs> but, uh, you you know, there, there's another discussion for another day because... I'm just going to sum it up. Because the Storm King here was presented as a buffoon in the movies. But in the comics, he was kind of villainous to a point. But we got no idea how bad he can really be. The comic presents him as a badass because... He doesn't really care about the goal or nothing. He just wants magical powers. And he just wants stuff. Like, what kind of villain wants stuff? My goodness. Villains, by definition, are the most motivated beings in an entire story. Yeah, true that. But when you look at him, his motivation is, eh, you know what? Like I said. I want to conquer. Yep, true. I want to conquer. <laughs> now, the comics did an, a different interpretation of his character, at least as far as I'm concerned. But, like you say, discussion for another day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But anywho, um, after Sandbar's story was told, Rainbow Dash calls uh, Smolder and Yona to be interrogated. And, like you mentioned before, Silverstream tells a story about the Hippogriffs. Uh, long story short, uh, previously there was only one holiday. Now there's only now there's three days because of their freedom. And like you mentioned, it's expanding on the Hippogriff lore. Before uh, before the Storm King was defeated, they celebrated in Sequestria. And after the Storm King was defeated, they now celebrate on land. And on the third day, they celebrated on both sides and Queen Novo gives gifts. Yay. Which is the closest we'll get to seeing her in the actual show. Yeah. Damn voice actors don't come cheap. Yeah, and also, if you really think about it, uh, fan favorite Tempest Shadow, uh, she's not going to be around. And also Kepper. Ay, ay, ay. Although, that shot of uh, Novo giving Silverstream a gift, I gotta say, Silverstream looks a little scary without the coloring around her beak. True, true. Kind of looks like a changeling's. The old evil changeling mouth. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's going for the uh, art style from the movie kind of thing, so it makes sense that they try to do this one. Really, I remember the beaks being colored in the movie as well. Budget silver, budget. Uh, but uh, let's see. Um, we move on to the well conclusion or uh, last part of the story because. Once Smolder and Yona comes in, they kind of argue because nobody here is admitting to the, what you would call this, crime. So they argue, they sling mud all over the place, and they bicker until Galastir just screams at the top of his lung, telling people to stop, and says that it's his fault, like he was the one that 
did it. And he tells the story of his holiday, which is the Blood Moon, <laughs> the Blue Moon Festival. Because griffins are only nice once in a blue moon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes sense. <laughs> I didn't see that one. Oh, my goodness. Well, here's the thing for me. It's a holiday where all griffins gather together for a meal and try not to offend each other as they get on one another's nerves. That's not Christmas-based. That's Thanksgiving. Well, Silver, each culture have their own holidays and they celebrate it in their own way. So I'm not docking points for that. No, but I just noticed the the uh, parallels. Like, oh, man, all they have to do is introduce politics and it's complete uh, one-to-one comparison. Who say they didn't? <laughs> okay, actually, let's talk about that for a sec. Because why did they send an orphaned griffin to the School of Friendship? Why? Well, it's kind of easy because Gallus here has no potential. He has no family. Even if he perish in Equestria, nobody's going to miss him. So he is a loose end that is willing to be, well, sacrificed. And that may very well be true. It's, it does, it's just sort of brutally economic, especially if the Griffins didn't really buy into it. But I believe there's a counter interpretation that a big trait in stories is that a future king must live a life of destitution or that ignobility. I'm not even sure that's a proper word, but there you go. Or is it ignominity? To the dictionary! <laughs> but basically, he's living below the station he could occupy. That is to inject a sense of humility for once they ascend. Uh, the most recent, <laughs> and I use the term loosely, the most recent uh, Game of Thrones, Song of Ice and Fire books uh, talks about this. It's possible, or at least this is the idea of a story, that Gallus is a direct heir, that, and he doesn't know it, to the Griffin Kings. And this is all to try to get him ready to interact with the larger world, because the Griffins can't keep doing what they used to. True, but according to Griffin history, they've always been that way. Well, that's just it. They've always been that way, but given how far they've fallen, uh, someone, likely Grandpa Gruff, who I kind of wonder... They say in this episode that everyone just calls him that. That's not his real name. So it makes me wonder, hmm, who was he before? He could be that grouchy old grandpa that lives in a corner there and tells people or tells kids to stay off his lawn. Or he might be the king who lost the the Boris, uh, the idol of Boreas. I would want to agree with you there because it sounds sound, but I'm thinking... Because of the gap in time and the stories being told, the destruction that's there, I don't know. I like the idea, but I'm thinking that the gap in time. Oh, but time in Equestria is so hard to determine because we've seen places go to wreck and ruin in a week. <laughs> True. Remember Fluttershy uh, in Putting Your Hoof Down? She's doing that Hulk long walk to her cottage. Yep, I can hear the piano. It somehow deteriorates in, like, five minutes. Hey, she, she has a set designer there. Discord. Discord just steps fingers. I'd love it if a griffin goes to bed one night, wakes up the next morning, looks outside, and suddenly everything's ruined. It's like, ah, oh, what happened here? Oh, boys. Fallout 76. <laughs> oh, there. That's just the terrible game was released. <laughs> yes. Uh, but still, um, I don't think we told the story yet. But sorry, anywho. What story? It's... They get together, they, they try to not act like jerks. Yeah, true that. yeah, very short. But one interesting thing about this picture here is that uh, Grandpa Gruff is sitting at a table with Gilda, Gabby, and a young griffin. And we got no idea who that is. And we, with the story or with the way that, uh, what you might call this, Gallus is telling, we got no idea if they're all related or not. I'm going to say no, that Grandpa Gruff just seems to draw these folks in. Probably? Let's see here. What would you name that little that little griffin? I don't think we got a name for the little one. Gale. Gale? Really? Gale the griffin. Really, you know? Yes. Where did you read that? Like, where? Oh, no, I'm making it oh, up. Oh, okay. Uh, I mean, the criteria is it's got to start with a G, mm -hmm. and it's got to reflect some sort of personality, like, you know, Gabby. Even Gallus is uh, based on the theme of the wind. 
So, Gale's the only word that comes to mind right off the bat that is wind-related, and also G. Ah, yes. And Gilda? Gilda, uh, Gilda, I think, is that more derived from gold, like Gilded? I got no idea. To, like, I think I've heard of Gilda before this, so to me, Gilda is a real name. It is a real name. and Actually, I just did a search in Google. First thing that comes up with it was a 1946 film noir. Oh, my. Titled Gilda. Gilda. So let's see here. Gilda name origin. So where you look for the origins of Gilda, I'll continue on. Uh, Silver Stream says, wow, that sounds awesome. And you have your cousins and whatnot. And Galicia says, cousin? What is cousin? I, I got no idea what is cousin. And Silver Stream just laughs and, <laughs> you're pulling my leg. Are you? Wait, what? You got no idea? You're, you're an orphan? Oh no, that, that sounds sad. And even though the Blue Moon Festival is there and everybody's celebrating it, Gallus never once celebrate the holiday with anyone. And this year, this year is the turning point where fans fall in love with Gallus and they want to give him a big hug because of this. And you can play the Hulk music as he's walking away. It's, it really works. Sorry. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. I'm not crying. <laughs> you are. Oh, boy. So, but, yeah. And once he explains or confess that he was the one that did it and he didn't want to go home for the holidays because he didn't have anything or anyone to go home to, he just wants to stay with his friends a bit longer so that he felt like he had someone to stay with and everybody was in shock and he just says that okay guys i'm sorry like i just wanted to stay with you guys a bit longer but after hearing your story and how you really enjoy them i, I felt bad and i'm gonna go confess and twilight rainbow dash just says now nah, we we know already we, we we know it was you come on how they knew is a little beyond me but i like Okay, there's several things I like about this. One, yes, I fell in love with Gallus as a character because of this. Mm -hmm. I mean, he tries to come off as this tough, aloof guy, but you get to see the vulnerability. That is inherent in a lot of Griffins, I think. This is also Twilight being a much better headmare than she was in earlier episodes. What was the episode that I mean, you called her dumb and this episode redeemed her? Hmm, dumb? Did I call her dumb? Not really, but I'm just paraphrasing. Well, let's see here. Uh, marks for effort. There was there was that episode where she basically judged and condemned the Crusaders without even asking them. Uh. Uh, that was impulsive and short-sighted and was definitely a very weak moment for her. And there's also a matter of principles where she keeps several magical artifacts in a trunk in her office. I, I feel like that was not a good security uh, measure. But this one, this is an episode that makes you believe she can be a good uh, leader of this school. And that's important. Really cool. Unfortunately, a lot of this school, we only get to check in when they're doing things wrong. It's nice to see them doing things right. And talking about doing things right. But, sorry, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say I found the name origin of Gilda, and it's rather fascinating. Oh, what, what is it? Originally, an Italian short form of names contained the Germanic element guild, meaning sacrifice or value. Oh. Now, she she is a griffin. She puts a lot of value on gold, but she's the one who sacrificed the idol of Boreas for something that she truly values. Her friendship with Rainbow Dash. Huzzah! Yay! I don't know if they were aware of that name meaning, but it fits really well. Hmm... The, I would want to say yes because of Lauren, but when you really look at how season one was and knowing that they won't be introducing Grilda back again till season four, nah, I, I think it was just a good coincidence. And I think that was season five. Five. See? Even later. Yeah. Even later. But back to the student six. Yep. I still get floored when, when Sandbar says, so it wasn't Ocellus. <laughs> it's like... It's like it's like, dude, are you blaming the changeling just because she's a changeling? Oh, boys. What the hey, brah? Yep. 
but the Hague. But Sembar has a redeeming factor after this because once Gallus confesses his crime and says that he'll well stay behind and do stuff, uh, Silverstream comes along and says, I'll stay along with you. Ostella says she stays along with you. Yona says uh, she'll stay along. And Sandbar says he'll stay along. And Smolder begrudgingly says she'll do too. Although I love the caption in uh, on the MLP wiki. Apparently friendship is peer pressure. <laughs> My little pony. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but this is in many ways beat for beat uh, the Ticketmaster. And revisiting that. And there's a criticism then that I think applies here as well. Basically, to make one member of the team feel bad, uh, feel good rather, everyone else is giving up going home. And we just heard about how much they love their traditions. Rather than have them all stay in one place, why can't Gallus go with one of them and be a guest at one of these festivals with kind of a rotating schedule through the years? Yeah, that sounds good. But hey, it's one of those stories where uh, Gallus mentioned that he never had any friends or family before this and they felt honored and want to be with, there for him and with him and stuff. I know it sounds cliche and your idea is much better, but still, this way we get more ponies in the episode and it does quote-unquote makes sense for that three-episode holiday special that came out in China? Oh, well, we'll get those in uh, in America soon enough. Yeah, I'm still confused that China got it first. Uh, at, actually, at the time we're probably posting this review, this review, it uh, they may have already aired. Yeah, that's true because we're recording this on December 9th. So we got no idea if it's out yet or not. But anyway, with that out of the way... Twilight says, all right, everyone, that's awesome. So you guys learn about honesty and friendship, so you're not going to do any friendship class or whatever. So what about if you guys join me for heartwarming in my castle? That's really blinged out. And some say it's an eyesore, but I think it's great. So yeah, join me there. It actually looks okay in the snow. The snow creates more of a unifying element between the castle and the town. But yes, it is an eyesore. <laughs> My opinion of that has not changed, even after several seasons. Uh, yes. But anywho, they, they clean up stuff, and uh, they have merriment, and yay, episode ends. So with that, let's head into discussion and final thoughts. So, Silver, what do you think, man? Oh, this was a this was a real treat. All the fun stories fleshing out the world a little bit more. There are times where it gets a little frustrating, mostly because... My Little Pony, it presents other cultures as basically inferior. They try to go out of their way to say, yeah, the, this this culture, all they do is be jerks to one another. They need to learn from us, the ponies. And I'm like, I'd rather it be an exchange of ideas. True, true. Right now, sometimes the world is built up in a way that is a little too egocentric. Or even more terrifying, the... Uh, Oh, what was that old saying? The ways of England are the ways of the world. <laughs> okay, I kind of remember that. Well, not really, because I'm kind of a, what you would call this, subsidiary of British, because they came down and plundered us. I mean, uh, re-educated us. Yes, that's what we meant to say. Oh, viva double speed. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> uh, bip, bip, cheerio, hefty and whatnot. A what, what, what? <laughs> Oh, boys. <laughs> but yes. There's that element running through, but even then, the excitement and the enthusiasm for most of the stories, aside from the darkness of Smolder and the depression of Gallus. And the lameness of Sandbar. <laughs> oh, even Sandbar's lameness. At least it has some energy to it. He really sells the idea. Just got to work on your ending, Bear. Got to stick the landing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, honestly, this episode was fun like the stories for the creatures are awesome and we, we get to have an insight on how they operate or their like, how do you put this? we get more lore that's what we want like people have always been asking for more lores for the episode from the show and when the showrunner gives us the lore we don't like it and we yell at them because this is not what we want <laughs> go write your own fan fictions 
I like the lore. Some people do. You remember way back in the days when people were asking for more lore and then once you got it, they didn't like it. <laughs> well, they're all screaming about lore at all because we're worth it too. <laughs> uh, yes. But still, uh, I think the most biggest take back or thing that we got out of this was Gallus. Like having his backstory about him being an orphan. That's, well, I, I think Gallus is the first official character in MLP to be an orphan or stated out to be an orphan. Yeah, Scootaloo's still got to wait for confirmation. Yep, because, well, quote-unquote, she has parents, but they're kind of on vacation or, or on a business trip, and she's living with her two aunts. Yep. So that's in the books, and like in a snap, the showrunners could say, nah, that didn't happen, y'all. So, yeah, um... You know, honestly, I like this episode. This episode was a lot of fun, and there's no real discussion point to stay here. I mean, if there is, I think we need an hour just to talk about it, especially with the Storm King and his thing about Bob. Or lack thereof. Yeah. Although, Norman, you didn't tell me your favorite story. Oh, um, well, in all honesty, I kind of like Gallus. You like Gallus. You like you like the depressing one where no one's living up to the ideal. It's not that. Like I think I like the outcome of it. He set up the story about how sad he is that he doesn't really have a family. And the outcome was friends go hug him and make him feel good. And he has friends and quote-unquote families now. That's what I see. And if to be honest, I do like some of the story because he was evil. <laughs> I gotta say, I'm starting to wonder if I need to play you some Snow Patrol. <laughs> nah, man. I got my chemical romance. Or maybe we just need to cheer you up. You know, watch a little something else. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yes. But well, anyway, Silver, what are you going to do next week? Well, we're going to do something special. Uh, we've been covering each individual issue of The Legends of Magic. Now it's time to go for the big story. The grand coming together as they assemble. And, well, find out what's their end game. Oh, yes. And next week, we are going to review Avengers Endgame. Wait, I know. Uh, No, sorry. That is not coming out till next year. Uh, I mean, we're going to review My Little Pony Legends of Magic issue 7 to 12. The end game. I'm saying, Norman, if you somehow got an early screening or review copy of that movie, (laughs) I would be your servant for (laughs) that. I am from the future. I got the Blu-ray. <laughs> and you didn't bring a lot of tickets? What's wrong with you? It doesn't work that way, man. Anything to do with cash does not work that way. Sigh. It's the time cop thing. They won't let you time cop. <laughs> Fo- <laughs> fooey. Uh, but yes, that will be next week's thing. So anyway, if you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, you can contact us at com. You can also reach us on the Twitters. The show's Twitter account is at the MBS Show, and my personal Twitter account is at Norman Sanzo. Silver, where can the good people find you? Well, you can find me on the Twitters under MLP Silver Quill. Similar address for Deviant Art. Just do, just do a search for MLP Silver Quill, and on YouTube a little a quick search for the Silver Quill or After the Fact, and you will find my YouTube channel. You can also find me on Equestria Daily every Wednesday as I publish a comic review or editorial. Yes, that's one way to keep up with the comics if they come out. And talking about early release, how did you get those comics review out fast? Oh, I never tell my little secrets. <laughs> oh no, how, how? Oh, I got no idea. I got no word for it. Oh, mostly I don't want to give away the examples of my blood sacrifice. <laughs> Oh, boys. And also, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes, YouTube. Don't forget to press the bell icon to stay up to date and Stitcher Radio. And also, like our Facebook page. You can also catch us on PonyvilleLive.com. Links are in the show notes. Also, do subscribe to the Review and Discussion Podcast on iTunes and Stitcher Radio. Over there, you'll catch us reviewing this mobile. Because YouTube doesn't really do the whole turn your phone off while jogging thing because that's dumb and it's only for YouTube Prime members so boohoo and if you would like to support the show you can do so at patreon.com with every support you'll get a week's early access to the review and discussion podcast exclusive and deleted content and a huge thank you from me and talking about thank yous I would like to thank Master of Lag Amy Charles Lucky Knight Tristan Starstream Delta Cat and also Jeff thank you so much guys you're great Anyway, I have been on this, so 
and the Silver Queen. And we will catch you next week with another awesome episode. See ya. Merry Christmas. Oh, no, I don't. Our need is here again. Why have we not done another Retro Night Bomb? Oh, yeah. some other bomb. <laughs> Actually, that would be a good episode for the students' six. Have them take a look at it.